Well, speaking of history, we have two gentlemen on our set who have been looking at history to find some of the trends and to help us understand what might be ahead for us uh, in this country and globally. Neil Howe and William Strauss. We'll start with Neil Howe this morning. We've always heard the phrase, history repeats itself. When people say it, are they right? Well, we argue in, this, uh, in our book that in many respects, history does repeat itself. Uh, we take a close look at the rhythms of American history, and in our book, we make the following big prediction, that beginning about 10 years from now, America is due to enter a era of crisis, an era of political and social upheaval that will last uh, around 20 years or so until the late 2020s. Uh, we call this era a fourth turning, and we think it's going to be a big threshold for the history of our nation. It's going to be something on par with World War II and the Great Depression are going back the length of a human lifespan before then, the Civil War, or the, going back the length of another human lifespan, uh, the American Revolution. It could be a time of tragedy or, or a time of great opportunity. Uh, it could, of course, uh, uh, bring pain and suffering, but more importantly, uh, historically, these kind, these eras of crisis, these eras of, of, of uh, reconstruction allow us to raise our civilization up to a new level. What causes this cycle is the aging of generations. There are four different kinds of generations, and, and their archetype depends upon when in history they were born. And one very remarkable pattern in our history, going back all the way to uh, the beginning of modernity in Western civilization, is, is five times in a row, the boomer-like generations who were born in the immediate aftermath of one great crisis, the equivalent of World War II, these generations are raised indulgently as children. They come of age with what historians call a spiritual awakening, attacking the institutions of their elders. When they reach midlife, they become moral trumpeters. They argue about values. They have the culture wars of their centuries. And then it has happened five times in a row that these boomer-like generations, upon entering old age, have become the stern and principled priest warriors who have pushed their society into the next great gate in history. Is this something that only happens in the United States? No, it, it happens uh, to other countries as well, and, and we actually spend part of our book talking about Western Europe. We do believe it happens in, it's, it's, this pattern is unique to modern societies, societies in which uh, people can redefine phases of life and social roles in each phase of life according to the particular generations coming of age, so that in a strictly traditional society, it's hard to have a cycle of history because each generation is repeating the prescribed roles of the generation that came before it. But in societies like the West, and in particular in, in America, uh, where we can change our institutions to fit the tastes of each batch of leaders coming through the system and each batch of parents coming through the, uh, uh, who are at the heads of households and, and uh, giving directions to schools, you can have a generational cycle. And I, I will say that many historians, obviously uh, uh, Toynbee, Schlesinger, you can go back all the way to Polybius, uh, have looked at cycles and have, and have always hypothesized that they have a generational explanation. As Schlesinger talks about his own cycle, he says the generation is the mainspring. And what we've really done in our book is to explain why it's the mainspring and how, how, how these cycles of life are related to the cycles of history. And it, we think it makes our book um, a very, very personal one for a lot of readers. Bill Strauss and Neil Howe have collaborated on books in the past. Their current one is called The Fourth Turning, and we're going to be talking about that till the top of the hour. We do welcome your participation. This is a first-time caller's morning on C-SPAN, so if you're calling this morning, make it your first time to have participated, and we, we do welcome your calls from around the country. The numbers will be on the screen throughout the program, and we'll put up our fax lines and email addresses as well. If this is inevitable <coughs> that we run in 20-year cycles, by publishing this, uh, what can anybody do about it? It seems like there's doom ahead in the short term, but... Well, it's not necessarily doom. It does mean an era of crisis in which there will be a redefinition of the social order. It could bring a bad war. Yes, that's true. And in the last fourth turning, our society went out and invented the worst possible weapon and then deployed it. In the fourth turning before that, the Civil War had Washington and Richmond had weapons like that available. They sure would have used them. What you need to think about is, is history as a series of seasons, and it, it helps a little bit, Susan, to understand what the four turnings actually are. The first turning is a high, and that happened from VJ Day until the Kennedy assassination. We all remember, of course, the 1950s. Historians call it the Great American High. 
Then we had the awakening, the consciousness revolution, around the time that boomers came of age and Xers were children and today's senior citizens, the GI generation, were entering old age and the silent generation in between were, were entering midlife, a little bit unsure of, of where they stood on things. Then we had what we call the unraveling, the period that began with mourning in America in the middle 1980s as boomers have entered midlife, as the Xers entered young adulthood and as a new generation of specially protected children were being born. And one, of the, one of the real contrasts here is during the American high, uh, institutionally, America felt very muscular, very modern, very, uh, with a great sense of sol solidarity and direction, whereas the culture was weak and individualism was, to some extent, suppressed. And here in the unraveling, what we call the unraveling, our current era, it's reversed. Uh, uh, we, we feel institutionally in total disarray, very pessimistic. We feel that we are, we are greater as individuals than we are collectively. It was very much the opposite we felt before. And it's important to think in terms of historical parallels for today's era. We, we feel as though we are in something like the 1920s, if you adjust for the problems and the technologies of now. As Neil says, it's a time when individualism is strong. That was true in the 20s. It's a time when the culture felt decadent. That was true in the 20s. It was a time when there was a robust economy and a speculative binge. That was true then. It was a time when third parties were popular. It's a time when, when people had very little and declining civic trust. And you go back to the uh, 1850s and you can see similar kinds of patterns yeah. happening then. And you can see the same thing in the 1760s. Yeah. That's why we feel as though we're about eight to ten years before some spark in history will, will trigger a substantial change and a darkening of the public mood. Do you find that older people know this instinctively? Uh, we actually find a lot of, of interest among older, particularly those we, we define as the GI generation, those who were, uh, at least among men, draft eligible for World War II and who went through that war and were part, came of age with the last crisis, so to speak. Um, it's very important, all of the eras that Bill was just talking about were eras in which the previous hero generation, the generation which had an immensely close and cooperative relationship with public institutions, was just passing from the scene. And that's exactly the way we feel today. I mean, you remember all the Newsweek covers and Time covers we've seen recently about goodbye, farewell to the GI generation. Dole would be the last uh, member of that generation to have made a run for the presidency. Bush, it seems almost certain, will be the last president of that generation. A generation which, which inhabited the White House longer than any other in, generation in American history, totally overshadowing the silent generation of children during the Great Depression and World War II who may never get in the White House. Our first call for you, gentlemen, is from Esterville, Iowa. Good morning. Morning. I was wondering if uh, this change in cycle is going to come from the political arena or if it's going to come from the civilian arena. Bill Strauss? If you look at, at history and you see what happened in the 1920s and 1850s and 1760s as people looked ahead at the future and what they could have envisioned in that time, Susan, they could not have imagined what ultimately happened in those crises. But they could have envisioned, and some people did envision, what the triggers to those crises were. They were the issues that, that were being deferred. I mean, an example, in the 20s, in the early 20s, you could have envisioned a great market crash. You could have even envisioned a big political reversal, a realigning election. No one could have predicted the New Deal, the A-bomb, and VJ Day, and a total redefinition of America's role in the world and the relationship of government to society. So, and you go back to the previous crisis. In the 1850s, you could have predicted the election of an abolitionist-leaning president. You could never have predicted Gettysburg, you know, the most horrible war that anyone had ever been aware of uh, uh, in the New World. And th this is our lesson. People, if you look forward to, to the year 2005 or 2008, that era, we can predict the kinds of things which will push us into this mood. We cannot predict how we will emerge. Well, for example, things like road nuclear weapons or the collapse of Social Security and Medicare along with the rest of the mountain of federal debt or the spreading of uh, rich and poor and, and class warfare and or racial problems in, in America. Or secessionist movements. We've you know, heard a lot of press recently about that. Um, These are things that you can see seeds of today, and what we are warning is that these problems have a way of congealing into one large storm 
that becomes a great gate in history. But we don't know what the next Gettysburg or D-Day will be. Next calls from Jacksonville, Florida. Good morning. Hi. Um, I was just, uh, uh, th this is actually more or less of an observation that I was making. Uh, it seems that uh, the cycles that you're talking about, isn't it true that you have a group of people who have worked very hard to get where they are, to make, to amass their wealth? and um, then pass it on to their children. And as the children grow up, they become more of that elite uh, society that, that turns to the government and starts forming more of the government institutes that, that we see. And then we see the, the, um, the rebellion like we have right now from the right and from uh, working class people who are now banding together and wanting to become entrepreneurial in themselves. So you see an economic cycle happening. Yeah. Well, it is true that generations of narcissists do not produce narcissistic children. They produce more collectivist children. We're seeing that right now with, with the boomers. We have Bill Clinton arguing with broad support from his peers for school uniforms. And it is true that we are raising a generation of children today which is we think in history going to resemble the generation that raised boomers. They are going to resemble today's senior we, we, citizens. We call this the hero archetype as opposed to boomers who more embody what we call the prophet archetype. Hero archetypes are born just after a period of, of, of uh, spiritual awakening when attitudes toward child rearing are beginning to tighten. Uh, prophet archetypes are born just after a crisis when attitudes toward child rearing are beginning to become more indulgent. It's the oscillation and the way children are raised that is one of the great mainsprings of history's cycles. One thing that has not existed before in history is widespread technology. Have oh, you, yes, there has. But oh, to the look point at of the, the 1920s. But what about the point of the Internet being in uh, potentially everyone's household? Look at the point of the automobile being in everyone's household in the 1920s. There have been other times when there have been major technological leaps which have redefined American self-definition. And our point is that that it is the societal mindset that takes the technology and crafts it into whatever the society feels it needs at the time. Recall how in the 1950s we were fearful that computer technology would lead to Big Brother. Now we are afraid that it is cutting our society into shards. That is a reflection of the societal mood more than the technology. This is actually a point we make in our book, is that to a lot of extent, there's a lot of technological determinism out there. People think, well, because we invent a silicon chip that pushes our society. We say that People invent a technology, but it's a social mood which uses that technology for what we want, when we want it. And a computer is an excellent example of that. San Anselmo, California. Uh, yes, it's uh, my observation that, uh, you know, the Gingrich type of faction kind of represents, you know, the older generation and, the, you know, the Clinton is kind of an intermediary between uh, that representation and the leftist tendencies of the uh, Democratic liberal forces in society, and it's uh, my uh, wonder what your observations are on this. That both Newt Gingrich and Bill Clinton are uh, excellent examples of boomer generation leadership. And I, I should preface that by saying we define boomers as born between 1943 and 1960. We push back the years slightly to define them as in terms of uh, location and history rather in terms of their fertility rate. Um, but both of them are obsessed with the cultural direction of this country much more than they are by institutional uh, programmatic reform. Uh, both Bill Clinton and Newt Gingrich have said as much. We find that boomers and boomer type generations all their lives are obsessed with values and the culture first. They think if you get that right, politics and everything else follows behind that. Very different from the GI generation who took culture for granted and were obsessed with institution building. It's one of the contrasts between an outer focus generation and an inner focus generation like boomers. I want to tell the audience a little bit about both of you before we go any farther. Neil Howe is a uh, graduate of Yale with graduate degrees in history and economics. He helped uh, draft Dick Glam's national thrift plan. Is that for his last campaign? Yes. Uh, w it has served as chief economist to the National Taxpayers Union, senior advisor to the Blackstone Group, which is what? Uh, that's an investment bank in New York. And senior advisor to the Concord Coalition, a group we're familiar with here in Washington. Where's your hometown? Uh, Right now, it's here in the D.C. area. Originally, I'm from California. What part? Uh, the Bay Area. And Bill Strauss, also from Northern California, has a degree from Harvard, degrees in economics, law, and public policy, and served as staff to President, F President Ford's clemency board and counsel to two Senate subcommittees. How did the collaborative uh, effort between the two, this is your third book together, how yes. did it all start? 
Back in the 1980s, I met Neil, and I had in the back of my mind the idea of writing a history of American generations. I had four small children then, and I was actually quite concerned about the mountain of debt and unfunded pension liabilities that were accruing while I was working in the Senate. And uh, I, I wanted to tell the story in terms of generational endowments, because I felt that as a society we were not doing a good job. Uh, we found we had a common interest in this subject, and we decided in 1987 to begin writing our first book, Generations. And as we began that, we saw that, that there was this remarkable pattern of generations, uh, that, that the relationship between our parents, the GI generation of Dole and Bush, and our own boomer generation had happened before, uh, during the, the early part of of this century, and then before that in the 1830s, and before that in the 1740s, and, and, and we consider that a remarkable story. Now, that's how we wrote Generations, and in Generations we actually made a number of predictions about the 1990s, about how there would be culture wars, and how there would be the rise of a new alienated economics-focused generation like Gen X, how there would be new specially protected children, and, and when that started to come to pass, we, we decided we wanted to write the fourth turning. Whiteville, North Carolina. Good morning. Yes, Susan, C-SPAN is great. Thank you. I'd like to ask them, through the years, we have elected these congressmen, senators, presidents to go t to Washington. Don't you think we have paid them dearly, paid them to destroy our country? They've taken our money and we're down the drain. I like their opinion of that. Can you believe what they've done to us? Well, right, right now the leaders we have reflect our social mood. Americans don't seem to care as much about government now, and so they're, they're comfortable with, with the, uh, the standoff that we see. Uh, in the fourth turning, Neil and I make the point that both political parties have some responsibility for what the problem is and, and as well as some opportunity for what the solution is. Up to now, the Republicans have had a reasonably good sense of the kind of civic sacrifice we require, but they don't understand the purpose of civic authority. They keep undermining people's confidence in government, whereas the Democrats have the opposite problem. They don't have the ability, especially with this president, to ask the American people to, to give up something and to do something hard. In the coming era, we are going to need both public sacrifice and a resurgent civic authority. Let me ask you, since you've tracked the cycles, go back to the uh, abscam years in Congress. Did that kind of Congress reflect what was going on in society at the time? Does it fit in with your generational charts? Uh, well, I guess you're referring to uh, the silent generation coming of power. Um, <laughs> That actually was the last time we had a generational transition before the boomers. Uh, I should just add, these last three elections have seen a huge boomer influx into all levels of government, into uh, Congress, the White House, all the state legislatures. Uh, this, this has been the time for boomers. And finally, with this last election, into the Senate, which interestingly, over the past two years, has always been regarded as this island of moderation and politeness, right? precisely because it was the only part of government in which the silent generation was still presiding while the rest was overrun by these bomb-throwing, uh, train-wrecking boomers. Um, the previous generational transition occurred in the early 1970s, and that was just as the Vietnam War was winding down, Watergate was all in the news, and we had the so-called Watergate babies, which were the, the huge influx of candidates born too late to be in World War II. And there, in a way, that was really the transition when America, in a sense, began to fragmate, uh, fragment and began to be less of a common mission toward the future, toward a commonly acknowledged future, and became much more uh, self-doubting, other-directed, uh, committee-run, uh, uh, interested in deferring and delaying and discussing, rather than that same GI generation long strides, you know, with Kennedy and, and LBJ of moving toward the future with very little reflectiveness. And one thing that Neil and I are finding on our website, and by the way, we invite our viewers here to join us at www.fourthturning.com to, to uh, have a discussion about some of these issues with us online. But we are finding that it is the silent generation right now, the people who are the children of the Depression and World War II, who are just coming to a real generational consciousness. They've never elected a president. They've lost the House of Representatives. They are right now matched by boomers in the Senate. Their influence is definitely waning. 
and, and they're finally getting a sense of what their responsibilities will be as elders. And they're going to be a very different kind of elders from the way the GI senior citizens have been. In what way? They are not going to defend the elder lobbies as much. I think ARP had better watch out because uh, the silent generation will leave it a much more youth-focused, other-directed, and splintered organization than the, it's the been. The silent generation feels a lot more guilt about where America has gone. The, the, the GI generation of Reagan and Kennedy never felt much guilt and felt a great sense of collective confidence about everything they did was really the way it ought to be. They really didn't, they, they weren't by nature a reflective generation. In fact, a lot of, oh my gosh, I should have made another kind of decision. They believed that they had earned their entitlements. This new silent generation, they don't feel that they really are entitled the same way. I, and I've noticed that among, among uh, senior groups that I've talked to, the term senior citizen is now beginning to fall into disuse among the younger retirees, basically the silent generation. Whereas grandparents support groups are sprouting up everywhere. Exactly. And if politicians just had a little bit of courage, they'd find that a great many people in their 60s would support cuts and benefits programs for seniors. This is what the Fourth Turning's website looks like if you're one of the internet users out there. Again, it's www.fourthturning.org. Dot com. Dot com. Thank you. Dot com. Thank you. <laughs> From memory, not bad. I got most of it. <laughs> Seattle is next. Good morning. Yes, I'm fascinated about this fourth turning concept. Uh, I have a quick comment and a question, though. I'm 42, and I got heavily involved in a lot of prophetic social justice types of work, although I'm not part of the 60s generation. But I've noticed in the last 15 or 20 years there's a growing sense of alienation, agnosticism, libertarianism, hedonism. I'm, you know, perplexed by that, this lack, lack of faith. Um, I don't have that because of my Catholic upbringing, but how does that tie in with with uh, warrior priests and this sense well, of prophetic mission. You read our book and you'll find out. And in our book, what you describe exactly uh, t characterizes uh, a, a third turning, third turning America, in which individuals feel very good about their personal lives, a lot of optimism, where they're going with their own families and their own kids. They feel zero confidence about their institutional life or who they are collectively. And there's a sense of exhaustion in the culture a sense that we've run out of new answers politically and in our civic life. The, the warrior priest is, doesn't occur in the third turning. That's a fourth turning phenomenon when the boomers who were indulged as kids were as young, in young adulthood were narcissists who became in their 50s moralizers, moralists. And we believe that the next phase in this life, in this, in this life cycle pattern, which we've seen, and again, by lining up parallel life cycles in the past, Particularly, think of uh, uh, Hawthorne and Emerson and Lincoln's uh, collective life cycle of their generation. The last phase was the warrior yeah. priest that you're talking about. And, and those figures will come from this generation. And unlike today's silent generation of leadership, who tend to defer, uh, defer problems and believe in compromise and discussion, boomer leaders in their, uh, toward the end of their tenure of leadership will be very much inclined to exaggerate problems in order to bring things to final resolution. Well, Lincoln's generation had a pretty good equivalent of the 60s back in the 1820s and 30s. Next call is from Oxford, Ohio. Yes, uh, I had a question for these two gentlemen. Um, I wanted to see, I uh, noticed that they've talked a lot about cycles of history um, in the American context. I wanted to know if they were more familiar with some of uh, political science's work, specifically Modolsky and Thompson, um, who asserted long cycles in history um, and how they led to war cycles. And, and secondly, um, if you're familiar, uh, I'm sure you are, of the rise and fall of great powers by Kennedy. Um, and if that really fits into what um, you two gentlemen have discussed in more of a broad world context. Yeah. Uh, yes, the, the, the answer to your first question, Modelsky and Thompson, is absolutely. And you will see them uh, mentioned and discussed in Chapter 2 of our book. Uh, Modelsky and Thompson, we think, uh, uh, interestingly, Modelsky not only talks about a four-part cycle of equivalent length to ours, but actually explicitly links it up to the same kinds of general ch generational changes. And we are, to some extent, we're indebted to, to some of his insights for helping us focus not just on these four turnings within the American context, but in a global international context. Let me address your question about the rise and fall of America, because it is through a fourth turning that America can stop the decline. It will bring the whole issue to a head. It will be one giant storm, which could result in a terrible, terrible tragedy, and we can all imagine what that could be. But it also 
could produce another great triumph, as the American Revolution and, and World War II certainly produced. And it is our feeling that the way civilizations ratchet up and become something better is through this cauldron of history that we call the fourth turning. So we would disagree with those who say that the United States of America is inevitably bound for decline. We think it's up to us. But the, but the survival of this nation, we do believe, is going to be very much at stake between the years 2005 and 2025. And we may, at the end of that era, not exist as a nation if we're not careful. One, one added point that's very important is that history doesn't move by gradual increments. History has its seasons. Like nature, there has to be a time of death and rebirth. Institutions become sclerotic. Things grow. Memories linger. There has to be a time of cleaning out, clearing out, and allowing something new to, to, to sprout up. And we've seen that several times in our history. And we forget today, we look around in third turning America, in America the 1990s, we think everything is gridlocked. Uh, we have, people talk about demosclerosis. We, uh, books come out called The End of Everything, The End oh, of like Culture, End of Politics, <laughs> End of. And, and we see the culture as people using parodies on parodies on parodies. There seems to be a lack of something new. The fourth turning is what allows something new to grow, both in politics, society, and the culture. Well, speaking of parodies, I have to pause for a minute to talk about the, another part of your life. Uh -oh. uh, <laughs> I've been unveiled. Well, it, uh, many people who watch C-SPAN are familiar with uh, a group that you helped found called the Capital Steps, yes. which uh, has gotten lots of national exposure. You've really, uh -huh. released some We're records. opening off Broadway next month, too. When, when you look at the kind of thoughts you think here, how do you reconcile both sides of your life? How do you do both comedy about Washington and how it works and also big issues like this? Well, my secret is two brilliant collaborators, Neil Howe with my writings and Elaine at Newport, not to mention a bunch of other uh, very bright people with the Capital Steps. And, and I, I enjoy doing the Capital Steps very much, and I think we provide a certain window on the American mood. Uh, this this book is uh, is something apart from that, and uh, I'm trying to to get people to to think a little bit more deeply in a variety of ways about the condition we find ourselves oh, in. Left brain, right brain. <laughs> uh, next telephone calls from York, Pennsylvania. Good morning. You're on the air. Good York? morning. Go ahead. Uh, I did not know anything about the book uh, that these gentlemen are talking about, but I am going to go out and buy it. I'm really impressed with what they're saying. The thing that I have observed, you know, as an observer of life. Uh, there's a focal point. We've got two schools of thought, you know, within America right now. We've got a school that wants the government to take care of us and be completely, you know, caring and nurturing. And we've got another school that doesn't want anything to do with it at all. Is this, you know, is this one of the turning points? Is this a focal point uh, in what's going to make the change in the next 10 years? Well, we see a, a rise of communitarian movements among liberals and conservatives. The Gary Bowers and Hillary Clintons have a common view in a lot of ways about what needs to be done with the family. And we see the communitarian movement as strengthening, the libertarian movement as having reached its peak and probably weakening. And by that we mean both the let it all hang out Hollywood liberal view as well as the free market Steve Forbes kind of view. Uh, and this is actually a good preparation for the nation for what will be required in the fourth turning when there will be a need for new community-based activity. We, uh, uh, as Bill said earlier, there's a, if you look at the two parties today, the two, two dominant ideologies in politics, part of each is going to be important for preparing for the fourth turning. Among Democrats, it's the ability to use civic authority. And among Republicans, it's the ability to uh, uh, call for personal sacrifice and to be able to rely on traditional virtues, which will come back in the fourth turning. But what could happen right at the start of the fourth turning is whichever dominant cultural view is in power, when the emergency strikes, that group could be out of power for a whole generation. That's what happened before the Civil War, as that broke out with the Democrats. It happened uh, uh, before the Great Depression with the Republicans. And it happened before the American Revolution American with loyalists. The Tories all went to another country. Yeah, exactly. Homewood, Illinois. Yeah, um, it seems like the cycles that go go on. Uh, talk about them almost in, t in terms of like predestination, like they're just going to happen. Um, are there certain roles that each of the generations, specifically my generation X, um, you see as needing to play, and also? What uh, type of role do you think the uh, New Age type religions are going to have? Yeah, well, let me answer the Generation X point. Your, your group 
your generation is the most criticized in America, and, and people do not fully appreciate some of the great values that Generation X brings to the American table, in particular the strong survival skills, the pragmatic instincts. These are going to be very, very important as this generation enters midlife, because with the, the boomers providing the vision and values at the top, with Generation X, what we call the 13th generation, uh, being the midlife pragmatists, the equivalent of the Dwight Eisenhowers of crisis. And with today's young millennial generation uh, becoming the next heroes, that is when the society will, will be powerful and will be able to solve problems. There is a danger, however, that Generation X could take the commercial slogans of today and c convert them into the political ideology of tomorrow. Just do it, whatever it takes. Why ask why? No excuses. And there's a danger in that. I, I think it's important to realize that we, we talked a bit about boomers earlier. Uh, our, uh, uh, our, our book plays no favorites with generations. We talk about the role that each type of generation plays in the upcoming crisis. And it's absolutely true that uh, the childhood of each generation prepares it in a way for the role that it later plays. The Generation X uh, was the survivalist uh, uh, hurried, uh, uh, unattended to kids of the consciousness revolution, uh, uh, an upbringing which really will prepare them for the pragmatism and survivalism they're going to have to show as, as midlife leaders uh, in the fourth turning America. The caller also asked about New Age religion and just one quick point about that and that is that uh, survey after survey shows that Generation X has a very low opinion of New Age religion. They associate it with boomers. Arlington, Virginia. Good morning, caller talking this morning about this perspective. It's very refreshing to get an overview of a different way. But I noticed that uh, you were not talking specifically about the culture in terms of the expressive arts. And I am very, very concerned with what might be considered a hip response to uh, cutting back, budgeting, the intellectual perception of how we're evolving. Because the first thing to be cut are the arts, the libraries, the museums, that's the very things which are sacred to our culture. And I'm wondering if you would talk to the whole, uh, the, the artistic expression and the intellectual growth of the country from your perspective, because so far I've heard the economic, the social, the political. Well, we, we talked earlier about the four turnings and what they were. Maybe now I should mention what the four archetypes are. Uh, they go by the following names, um, the hero generation, which is uh, born coming of age in a crisis, the artist generation, which grows up a children of a crisis, the prophet generation born after a crisis, and the nomad generation, of which we're talking about Generation X, born and raised during an awakening. Now, the reason I mention artist is because today's silent generation, we've looked at a lot of surveys on this, Today's silent generation, those who are today in their mid-50s to late-60s. Probably incru including uh, that last Probably caller. including <laughs> the last caller. Uh, are the most, throughout their lives, have been the most interested in artistic expression. And that was true in the 19, late 1940s, 1950s, 60s, 70s, and on into today. In fact, one big major concern of museums, of operas, of symphonies, of uh, libraries, of every institution of the fine arts all over this country is the passing away of their great generation of donors. Boomers are not going to these institutions. Boomers are not cultivating or patronizing the fine arts to the same extent as this generation that's now very affluent, giving a lot of money now, but they're looking down the road and they find this may not be true in the future. And in fact, that's another sign of the fourth turning is when the great generation responsible for cultivating and popularizing the fine arts and, the, and, the, and the, uh, the finest of artistic expression begins to move on and begins to be le re less relevant by, a, by younger generations that are deemed to be a little bit harder, a little bit less demonstrative. That's it for our time. I want to thank Neil Howe and Bill Strauss. Their book is called The Fourth Turning. It's published by Broadway Books. Gentlemen, thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And that's it for our time today. Thanks for being with us. We'll be back at 7 a.m. Eastern Time tomorrow.